Chapter One of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa. Chapter One The Palace of the Eagles east of the land of the rising sun there dwelled a king who spent all his days and half his nights in pleasure his kingdom was on the edge of the world according to the knowledge of those times and almost entirely surrounded by the sea nobody seemed to care what lay beyond the barrier of rocks that shut off the land from the rest of the world for the matter of that nobody appeared to trouble much about anything in that kingdom most of the people followed the example of the king and led idle careless lives giving no thought to the future the king regarded the task of governing his subjects as a big nuisance he did not care to be worried with proposals concerning the welfare of the masses and documents brought to him by his advisers for signature were never read for aught he knew they may have referred to the school regulations of the moon instead of the laws of trading and such like public matters don't bother me was his usual remark you are my advisers and officers of state deal with affairs as you think best and off he would go to his beloved hunting which was his favorite pastime the land was fertile and nobody had ever entertained an idea that bad weather might some year affect the crops and cause a scarcity of grain they took no precautions to lay in stocks of wheat and so when one summer there was a great lack of rain and the fields were parched the winter that followed was marked by suffering the kingdom was faced by famine and the people did not like it they did not know what to do and when they appealed to the king he could not help them indeed he could not understand the difficulty he passed it off very lightly i am a mighty hunter he said i can always kill enough beasts to provide a sufficiency of food but the drought had withered away the grass and the trees and the shortage of such food had greatly reduced the number of animals the king found the forests empty of deer and birds still he failed to realize the gravity of the situation and what he considered an exceedingly bright idea struck him i will explore the unknown territory beyond the barrier of rocky hills he said surely there will i find a land of plenty and at least he added it will be a pleasant adventure with good hunting a great expedition was therefore arranged and the king and his hunting companions set forth to find a path over the rocks this was not at all difficult and on the third day a pass was discovered among the crags and peaks that formed the summit of the barrier and the king saw the region beyond it seemed a vast and beautiful land stretching away as far as the eye could see in a forest of huge trees carefully the hunters descended the other side of the rock barrier and entered the unknown land it seemed uninhabited nor was there any sign of beast or bird of any kind no sound disturbed the stillness of the forest no tracks were visible as well as the hunters could make out no foot had ever trodden the region before even nature seemed at rest the trees were all old their trunks gnarled into fantastic shapes their leaves yellow and sere as if growth had stopped ages ago altogether the march through the forest was rather eerie and the hunters proceeded in single file which added to the impressiveness of this strange experience the novelty however made it pleasant to the king and he kept on his ways for four days and then the forest ended abruptly and the explorers came to a vast open plain a desert through which a wide river flowed far beyond rose a mountain capped by rocks of regular shape at any rate they appeared to be rocks but the distance was too great to enable any one to speak with certainty water said the vizier is a sign of life so the king decided to continue as far as the mountain 
a ford was discovered in the river and once on the other side it was possible to make out the rocks crowning the mountain they looked too regular to be mere rocks and on approaching nearer the king was sure that a huge building must be at the top of the mountain when they arrived quite close there was no doubt about it either a town or a palace stood on the summit and it was decided to make the ascent the next day during the night no sound was heard but to everybody's surprise a distinct path up the mountain was noticed in the morning it was so overgrown with weeds and moss and straggling creepers that it was obvious it had not been used for a long time the ascent was accordingly difficult but halfway up the first sign of life noticed since the expedition began made itself visible it was an eagle suddenly it flew down from the mountain top and circled above the hunters screaming but making no attempt to attack at length the summit was gained it was a flat plateau of great expanse almost the whole of which was covered by an enormous building of massive walls and stupendous towers this is the palace of a great monarch said the king but no entrance of any kind could be seen the rest of the day was spent in wandering round but nowhere was a door or window or opening visible it was decided to make a more serious effort next morning to gain entry however it seemed a greater puzzle than ever at length one of the most venturesome of the party discovered an eagle's nest on one of the smallest towers and with great difficulty he secured the bird and brought it down to the king his majesty bade one of his wise men Maflog, learned in bird languages to speak to it he did so in a harsh croaking voice the eagle replied i am but a young bird only seven centuries old i know naught on a tower higher than that on which i dwell is the eyrie of my father he may be able to give you information more he would not say the only thing to do was to climb the highest tower and question the father eagle this was done and the bird answered on a tower still higher dwells my father and on yet a higher tower my grandfather who is two thousand years old he may know something i know nothing after considerable difficulty the topmost tower was reached and the venerable bird discovered he seemed asleep and was only awakened after much coaxing then he surveyed the hunters warily let me see let me think he muttered slowly i did hear when i was a tiny eagle chick but a few years old now that was a long 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 time ago that my great-grandfather had said that his great-grandfather had told him he had heard that long 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 ago oh ever so much longer than that a king lived in this palace that he died and left it to the eagles and that in the course of many 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 thousands of years the door had been covered up by the dust brought by the winds where is the door asked Mufflog that was a puzzle the ancient bird could not answer readily he thought and thought and he fell asleep and had to be kept being awakened until at last he remembered when the sun shines in the morning he croaked its first ray falls on the door then worn out with all his thinking and talking he fell asleep again there was no rest for the party that night they all watched to make certain of seeing the first ray of the rising sun strike the palace when it did so the spot was carefully noted but no door could be seen digging was therefore begun and after many hours an opening was found through this an entrance was effected into the palace what a wonderful and mysterious place it was all overgrown with the weeds of centuries tangled masses of creepers lay everywhere over what once were trimly kept pathways and almost completely hiding the lower buildings in the crevices of the walls roots had insinuated themselves and by their growth had forced the stones apart it was all a terrible scene of desolation 
the king's men had to hack a way laboriously through the wilderness of weeds with their swords to the central building and when they did so they came to a door on which was an inscription cut deep into the wood the language was unknown to all but muflog who deciphered it as follows we the dwellers in this palace live for many years in comfort and luxury and then hunger came we had made no preparation we had amassed jewels in abundance but not corn we ground pearls and rubies to fine flour but could make no bread wherefore we die bequeathing this palace to the eagles who will devour our bodies and build their eyries on our towers a dread silence fell on the whole party when muflog read these strange words and the king turned pale this warning from the dead past was making the adventure far from enjoyable some of the party suggested the immediate abandonment of the expedition and the prompt return home they feared hidden dangers now but the king remained resolute i must investigate this to the end he said in a firm voice those who are seized by fear may return i will go on if needs be alone encouraged by these words the hunters decided to remain with the king one of them began to batter at the door but the king was anxious to preserve the inscription and after more cutting away of the weeds the key was seen to be sticking in the keyhole unlocking the door however was no light task for ages of rust had accumulated when finally this was accomplished the door creaked heavily on its hinges and a musty smell came from the dank corridor that was revealed the explorers walked ankle-deep in dust through a maze of rooms until they came to a big central hall of statues so artistically fashioned were they that they seemed lifelike in their attitudes and for a moment all held their breath this hall was dustless and muflog pointed out that it was an air-tight chamber evidently it had been specifically devised to preserve the statues these must be the effigies of kings said his majesty and on reading the inscriptions muflog said that was so at the far end of the hall on a pedestal higher than the others was a statue bigger than the rest in addition to the name there was an inscription on the pedestal muflog read it amid an awed stillness i am the last of the kings yea the last of men and with my own hands have completed this work i ruled over a thousand cities rode on a thousand horses and received the homage of a thousand vassal princes but when famine came i was powerless ye who may read this take heed of the fate that has overwhelmed this land take but one word of counsel from the last of the mortals prepare thy meal while the daylight lasts the words broke off the rest was undecipherable enough cried the king and his voice was not steady this has indeed been good hunting i have learned in my folly and pursuit of pleasure what i had failed to see for myself let us return and act upon the counsel of this king who has met the end that will surely be our own should we forget his warning looking out across the plain they had traversed his majesty seemed to see a vision of prosperous cities and smiling fertile fields in imagination he saw caravans laden with merchandise journeying across the intervening spaces and then as darker thoughts followed a cloud appeared to settle over the whole land the cities crumbled and disappeared the eagles swooped down and took possession of that which man had failed to appreciate and hold and after the eagles the dust of the ages settled slowly piling itself up year by year until everything was covered and only the desert was visible scarcely a word was spoken as the king and his hunters made their way back to the land east of the rising sun in all they had been away forty days when they recrossed the barrier of rocks they were joyously welcomed what have you brought asked the populace in a little while we shall be starving 
ye shall not starve said the king i have brought wisdom from the palace of the eagles from the fate and sufferings of others i have learned a lesson my duty at once he set to work to organize the proper distribution of the food supply and the cultivation of the land he wasted no more time on foolish pleasures and in due course the land east of the rising sun enjoyed happiness and prosperity and even established fruitful colonies in the plain overlooked by the palace of the eagles End of chapter one chapter two of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa. The Giant of the Flood. Just before the world was drowned, all the animals gathered in front of the ark, and Father Noah carefully inspected them all ye that lie down shall enter and be saved from the deluge that is about to destroy the world he said ye that stand cannot enter then the various creatures began to march forward into the ark father noah watched them closely he seemed troubled i wonder he said to himself how shall i obtain a unicorn and how shall i get it into the ark i can bring thee a unicorn father noah he heard a voice of thunder and turning round he saw the giant og but thou must agree to save me too from the flood be gone cried noah thou art a demon not a human being i can have no dealings with thee pity me whined the giant see how my figure is shrinking once i was so tall that i could drink water from the clouds and toast fish at the sun i fear not that i shall be drowned but that all the food will be destroyed and that i shall perish of hunger noah however only smiled but he grew serious again when og brought a unicorn it was as big as a mountain although the giant said it was the smallest he could find it lay down in front of the ark and noah saw by that action that he must save it for some time he was puzzled what to do but at last a bright idea struck him he attached the huge beast to the ark by a rope fastened to its horn so that it could swim alongside and be fed og seated himself on a mountain near at hand and watched the rain pouring down faster and faster it fell in torrents until the rivers overflowed and the waters began to rise rapidly on the land and sweep all things away father noah stood gloomily before the door of the ark until the water reached his neck then it swept him inside the door closed with a bang and the ark rose gallantly on the flood and began to move along the unicorn swam alongside and as it passed og the giant jumped on to its back see father noah he cried with a huge chuckle you will have to save me after all i will snatch all the food you put through the window for the unicorn noah saw that it was useless to argue with og who might indeed sink the ark with his tremendous strength i will make a bargain with thee he shouted from a window i will feed thee but thou must promise to be a servant to my descendants og was very hungry so he accepted the conditions and devoured his first breakfast the rain continued to fall in great big sheets that shut out the light of day inside the ark however all was bright and cheerful for noah had collected the most precious of the stones of the earth and had used them for the windows their radiance illumined the whole of the three stories in the ark some of the animals were troublesome and noah got no sleep at all the lion had a bad attack of fever in a corner a bird slept the whole of the time this was the phoenix wake up said noah one day it is feeding time thank you returned the bird i saw thou wert busy father noah so i would not trouble thee 
thou art a good bird said noah much touched therefore thou shalt never die one day the rain ceased the clouds rolled away and the sun shone brilliantly again how strange the world looked it was like a vast ocean nothing but water could be seen anywhere and only one or two of the highest mountain tops peeped above the flood all the world was drowned and noah gazed on the desolate scene from one of the windows with tears in his eyes og riding gaily on the unicorn behind the ark was quite happy ha ha he laughed gleefully i shall be able to eat and drink just as much as i like now and shall never be troubled by those tiny little creatures the mortals be not so sure said noah those tiny mortals shall be thy masters and shall outlive thee and the whole race of giants and demons the giant did not relish this prospect he knew that whatever noah prophesied would come true and he was so sad that he ate no food for two days and began to grow smaller and thinner he became more and more unhappy as day by day the water subsided and the mountains began to appear at last the ark rested on mount ararat and og's long ride came to an end i will soon leave thee father noah he said i shall wander round the world to see what is left of it thou canst not go until i permit thee said noah hast thou forgotten our compact so soon thou must be my servant i have work for thee giants are not fond of work and og who was the father of all the giants was particularly lazy he cared only to eat and sleep but he knew he was in noah's power and he shed bitter tears when he saw the land appear again stop commanded noah dost thou wish to drown the world once more with thy big tears so og sat on a mountain and rocked from side to side weeping silently to himself he watched the animals leave the ark and had to do all the hard work when noah's children built houses daily he complained that he was shrinking to the size of the mortals for noah said there was not too much food one day noah said to him come with me og i am going around the world i am commanded to plant fruit and flowers to make the earth beautiful i need thy help for many days they wandered all over the earth and og was compelled to carry the heavy bag of seeds the last thing noah planted was the grapevine what is this food or drink asked og both replied noah it can be eaten or its juice made into wine and as he planted it he blessed the grape be thou he said a plant pleasing to the eye bear fruit that will be food for the hungry and a health-giving drink to the thirsty and sick og grunted i will offer up sacrifice to this wonderful fruit he said may i not do so now that our labors are over noah agreed and the giant brought a sheep a lion a pig and a monkey first he slaughtered the sheep then the lion when a man shall taste but a few drops of the wine he said he shall be as harmless as a sheep when he takes a little more he shall be as strong as a lion then og began to dance around the plant and he killed the pig and the monkey noah was very much surprised i am giving thy descendants two extra blessings said og chuckling he rolled over and over on the ground in great glee and then said when a man shall drink too much of the juice of the wine then shall he become a beast like the pig and if then he still continues to drink he shall behave foolishly like a monkey and that is why unto this day too much wine makes a man silly og himself drank too much and many years afterwards when he was a servant to the patriarch abraham the latter scolded him until he became so frightened that he dropped a tooth abraham made an ivory chair for himself from this tooth 
afterwards og became king of bashan but he forgot his compact with noah and instead of helping the israelites to obtain canaan he opposed them i will kill them all with one blow he declared exerting all his enormous strength he uprooted a mountain and raising it high above his head he prepared to drop it on the camp of the israelites and crush it but a wonderful thing happened the mountain was full of grasshoppers and ants who had bored millions of tiny holes in it when king og raised the great mass it crumbled in his hands and fell over his head and round his neck like a collar he tried to pull it off but his teeth became entangled in the mass as he danced about in rage and pain moses the leader of the israelites approached him moses was a tiny man compared with og he was only ten ells high and he carried with him a sword of the same length with a mighty effort he jumped ten ells into the air and raising the sword he managed to strike the giant on the ankle and wound him mortally thus after many years did the terrible giant of the flood perish for breaking his word to father noah End of the giant of the flood chapter three of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by yehoshua ben avraham in ashland oregon jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude landa chapter three the fairy princess of ergetz one in a great and beautiful city that stood by the sea an old man lay dying mar shalmon was his name and he was the richest man in the land propped up with pillows on a richly decorated bed in a luxurious chamber he gazed with tears in his eyes through the open window at the setting sun like a ball of fire it sank lower and lower until it almost seemed to rest on the tranquil waters beyond the harbor suddenly mar shalmon roused himself where is my son bar shalmon he asked in a feeble voice and his hand crept tremblingly along the silken coverlet of the bed as if in search of something. "'I am here, my father,' replied his son, who was standing by the side of his bed. His eyes were moist with tears, but his voice was steady. "'My son,' said the old man, slowly and with some difficulty, "'I am about to leave this world. My soul will take flight from this frail body when the sun has sunk behind the horizon.' I have lived long and have amassed great wealth which will soon be thine. Use it well, as I have taught thee, for thou, my son, art a man of learning, as befits our noble Jewish faith. One thing I must ask thee to promise me. I will, my father, returned Bar Shalmon, sobbing. Nay, weep not, my son, said the old man. My day is ended, my life has not been ill spent. I would spare thee the pain that was mine in my early days when as a merchant I garnered my fortune. The sea out there that will soon swallow up the sun is calm now, but beware of it, my son, for it is treacherous. Promise me, nay, swear unto me, that never wilt thou cross it to foreign lands. Bar Shalmon placed his hands on those of his father. Solemnly I swear, he said in a broken voice to do thy wish never to journey on the sea but to remain here in this my native land tis a vow before thee my father tis an oath before heaven said the old man guard it keep it and heaven will bless thee remember see the sun is sinking mar shalmon fell back upon his pillows and spoke no more Bar Shalmon stood gazing out of the window until the sun had disappeared, and then silently sobbing, he left the chamber of death. The whole city wept when the sad news was made known, for Mar Shalmon was a man of great charity, and almost all the inhabitants followed the remains to the grave. Then Bar Shalmon, his son, took his father's place of honor in the city, and in him too the poor and needy found a friend whose purse was ever open, and whose counsel was ever wisdom. Thus years passed away. One day there arrived in the harbor of the city a strange ship from a distant land. 
Its captain spoke a tongue unknown, and Bar Shalmon, being a man of profound knowledge, was sent for. He alone in the city could understand the language of the captain. To his astonishment, he learned that the cargo of the vessel was from Mar Shalmon, his father. I am the son of Mar Shalmon, he said. My father is dead, and all his possessions he left to me. Then verily art thou the most fortunate mortal, and the richest on earth, answered the captain. My good ship is filled with a vast store of jewels, precious stones, and other treasures, and know you, O most favored son of Mar Shalmon, this cargo is but a small portion of the wealth that is thine in a land across the sea. Tis strange, said Bar Shalmon in surprise. My father said not of this to me. I knew that in his younger days he had traded with distant lands, but nothing did he ever say of possessions there, and moreover he warned me never to leave this shore. The captain looked perplexed. I understand it not, he said. I am but performing my father's bidding. He was thy father's servant, and long years did he wait for Marshalmon's return to claim his riches. On his deathbed he bade me vow that I would seek his master, or his son, and this have I done. He produced documents, and there could be no doubt that the vast wealth mentioned in them belonged now to Bar Shalmon. Thou art now my master, said the captain, and must return with me to the land across the sea to claim thine inheritance. In another year it will be too late, for by the laws of the country it will be forfeit. I cannot return with thee, said Bar Shalmon. I have a vow before heaven never to voyage on the sea. The captain laughed. In very truth I understand thee not, as my father understood not thine, he replied. My father was wont to say that Marshalmon was strange, and peradventure not possessed of all his senses to neglect his store of wealth and treasure. With an angry gesture, Marshalmon stopped the captain, but he was sorely troubled. He recalled now that his father had often spoken mysteriously of foreign lands, and he wondered indeed whether Marshalmon could have been in his proper senses not to have breathed a word of his riches abroad. Fear not thy vow, said the captain. Thy worthy father must of a truth have been bereft of reason in failing to tell thee of his full estate, and an oath to a man of mind unsound is not binding. That is the law in our land. So it is here returned Bar Shalmon, and with this remark his last scruple vanished. He bade a tender farewell to his wife, his child, and his friends, and set sail on the strange ship to the land beyond the sea. For three days all went well, but on the fourth the ship was becalmed, and the sails flapped lazily against the masts. The sailors had nothing to do but lie on deck and wait for a breeze, and Bar Shalmon took advantage of the occasion to treat them to a feast. Suddenly, in the midst of the feasting, they felt the ship begin to move. There was no wind, but the vessel sped along very swiftly. The captain himself rushed to the helm. To his alarm, he found the vessel beyond control. The ship is bewitched, he exclaimed. There is no wind and no current, and yet we are being borne along as if driven before a storm. We shall be lost. Panic seized the sailors, and Bar Shalmon was unable to pacify them. "'Someone on board has brought us ill luck,' said the bosun, looking pointedly at Bar Shalmon. "'We shall have to heave him overboard.' His comrades assented and rushed toward Bar Shalmon. Just at that moment, however, the lookout in the bow cried excitedly, "'Land ahead!' The ship still refused to answer the helm and grounded on a sandbank. She shivered from stem to stern but did not break up. No rocks were visible, only a desolate tract of desert land was to be seen, with here and there a solitary tree. "'We seem to have sustained no damage,' said the captain, when he had recovered from his first astonishment. "'But how are we going to get afloat again, I do not know. This land is quite strange to me.' He could not find it marked on any of his charts or maps, and the sailors stood looking gloomily at the mysterious shore." "'Had we not better explore the land?' said Bar Shalmon. "'No, no!' exclaimed the boatswain excitedly. "'See? No breakers struck on the shore. This is not a human land. This is a domain of demons. We are lost unless we cast overboard the one who has brought on us this ill luck!' said Bar Shalmon. "'I will land, and I will give fifty silver crowns to all who land with me.' 
Not one of the sailors moved, however, even when he offered fifty golden crowns, and at last Bar Shalman said he would land alone, although the captain strongly urged him not to do so. Bar Shalmon sprang lightly to the shore, and as he did so, the ship shook violently. What did I tell you? shouted the bosun. Bar Shalmon is the one who has brought us this misfortune. Now we shall refloat the ship. But it still remained firmly fixed on the sand. Bar Shalmon walked towards a tree and climbed it. In a few moments, he returned, holding a twig in his hand. The land stretches away for miles, just as you see it here, he called to the captain. There is no sign of man or habitation. He prepared to board the vessel again, but the sailors would not allow him. The bosun stood in the bow and threatened him with a sword. Bar Shalmon raised the twig to ward off the blow and struck the ship which shivered from stern to stern again. Is not this proof that the vessel is bewitched? cried the sailors, and when the captain sternly bade them remember that Bar Shalmon was their master, they threatened him too. Bar Shalmon, amused at the fears of the men, again struck the vessel with the twig. Once more it trembled. A third time he raised the twig. If the ship is bewitched, he said, something will happen after the third blow. Swish, sounded the branch through the air, and the third blow fell on the vessel's bow. Something did happen. The ship almost leaped from the sand, and before Bar Shalmon could realize what had happened, it was speeding swiftly away. Come back! Come back! He screamed, and he could see the captain struggling with the helm. But the vessel refused to answer, and Bar Shalmon saw it grow smaller and smaller and finally disappear. He was alone on an uninhabited desert land. What a wretched plight for the richest man in the world, he said to himself, and the next moment he realized that he was in danger indeed. A terrible roar made him look around. To his horror, he saw a lion making toward him. As quick as a flash, Bar Shalmon ran to the tree and hastily scrambled into the branches. The lion dashed itself furiously against the trunk of the tree, but for the present, Bar Shalmon was safe. Night, however, was coming on, and the lion squatted at the foot of the tree, evidently intending to wait for him. All night, the lion remained, roaring at intervals, and Bar Shalmon clung to one of the upper branches, afraid to sleep lest he should fall off and be devoured. When the morning broke, a new danger threatened him. A huge eagle flew round the tree and darted at him with its cruel beak. Then the great bird settled on the thickest branch, and Bar Shalmon moved stealthily forward with a knife which he drew from his belt. He crept behind the bird, but as he approached, it spread its big wings, and Bar Shalmon, to prevent himself from being swept from the tree, dropped the knife and clutched at the bird's feathers. Immediately, to his dismay, the bird rose from the tree. Bar Shalmon clung to its back with all his might. Higher and higher soared the eagle until the trees below looked like mere dots on the land. Swiftly flew the eagle over miles and miles of desert until Bar Shalmon began to feel giddy. He was faint with hunger and feared that he would not be able to retain his hold. All day the bird flew without resting across island and sea. No houses, no ships, no human beings could be seen. Toward night, however, Bar Shalmon, to his great joy, beheld the lights of a city surrounded by trees, and as the eagle came near, he made a bold dive to the earth. Headlong, he plunged downward. He seemed to be hours in falling. At last he struck a tree. The branches broke beneath the weight and force of his falling body, and he continued to plunge downward. The branches tore his clothes to shreds and bruised his body, but they broke his terrible fall, and when at last he reached the ground, he was not much hurt. 2. Bar Shalmon found himself on the outskirts of the city, and cautiously he crept forward. To his intense relief, he saw that the first building was a synagogue. The door, however, was locked. Weary, sore, and weak with long fasting, Bar Shalmon sank down on the steps and sobbed like a child. Something touched him on the arm. He looked up. By the light of the moon, he saw a boy standing before him. Such a queer boy he was, too. He had cloven feet, and his coat, if it was a coat, seemed to be made in the shape of wings. Ivri Anochi, said Bar Shalmon. I am a Hebrew. So am I, said the boy. Follow me. He walked in front with a strange hobble, and when they reached a house at the back of the synagogue, 
He leaped from the ground, spreading his coat wings as he did so to a window about twenty feet from the ground. The next moment, a door opened, and Bar Shalmon, to his surprise, saw that the boy had jumped straight through the window down to the door which he had unfastened from the inside. The boy motioned him to enter a room. He did so. An aged man, who he saw was a rabbi, rose to greet him. Peace be with you, said the rabbi, and pointed to a seat. He clapped his hand, and immediately a table with food appeared before Bar Shalmon. The latter was far too hungry to ask any questions just then, and the rabbi was silent too while he ate. When he had finished, the rabbi clapped his hands, and the table vanished. Now tell me your story, said the rabbi. Bar Shalmon did so. Alas, I am an unhappy man, he concluded. I have been punished for breaking my vow. Help me to return to my home. I will reward thee well and will atone for my sin. Thy story is indeed sad, said the rabbi gravely. But thou knowest not the full extent of thy unfortunate plight. Art thou aware what land it is into which thou hast been cast? No, said Bar Shalman, becoming afraid again. No, then, said the rabbi, thou art not in the land of human beings. Thou hast fallen into Ergetz, the land of demons, of jinns, and of fairies. But art thou not a Jew? asked Bar Shalman in astonishment. Truly, replied the rabbi, even in this realm we have all manner of religions, just as you mortals have. What will happen to me? asked Bar Shalman in a whisper. I know not, replied the rabbi. Few mortals come here, and mostly I fear they are put to death. The demons love them not. Woe! Woe is me, cried Bar Shalman. I am undone. Weep not, said the rabbi. I, as a Jew, love not death by violence and torture, and will endeavor to save thee. I thank thee, cried Bar Shalman. Let thy thanks wait, said the rabbi kindly. There is human blood in my veins. My great-grandfather was a mortal who fell into this land and was not put to death. Being of mortal descent, I have been made rabbi. Perhaps thou wilt find favor here and be permitted to live and settle in this land. But I desire to return home, said Bar Shalman. The rabbi shook his head. Thou must sleep now, he said. He passed his hands over Bar Shalman's eyes and he fell into a profound slumber. When he awoke, it was daylight and the boy stood by his couch. He made a sign to Bar Shalman to follow and through an underground passage he conducted him into the synagogue and placed him near the rabbi. Thy presence has become known, whispered the rabbi, and even as he spoke a great noise was heard. It was like the wild chattering of many high-pitched voices. Through all the windows and the doors a strange crowd poured into the synagogue. There were demons of all shapes and sizes. Some had big bodies with tiny heads, others huge heads and quaint little bodies. Some had great staring eyes, others had long, wide mouths, and many had only one leg each. They surrounded Bar Shalman with threatening gestures and noises. The rabbi ascended the pulpit. Silence, he commanded, and immediately the noise ceased. Ye who thirst for mortal blood, desecrate not this holy building wherein I am master. What ye have to say must wait until after the morning service. Silently and patiently they waited, sitting in all manner of queer places. Some of them perched on the backs of seats. A few clung like great big flies to the pillars. Others sat on the window sills, and several of the tiniest hung from the rafters in the ceiling. As soon as the service was over, the clamor broke out anew. Give us to the perjurer, screamed the demons. He is not fit to live. With some difficulty, the rabbi stilled the tumult and said, Listen unto me, ye demons and sprites of the land of Ergetz. This man has fallen into my hands, and I am responsible for him. Our king, Ashmedai, must know of his arrival. We must not condemn a man unheard. Let us petition the king to grant him a fair trial. After some demur, the demons agreed to this proposal, and they trooped out of the synagogue in the same peculiar manner in which they came. Each was compelled to leave by the same door or window at which he entered. Bar Shalmon was carried off to the palace of King Ashmedai, preceded and followed by a noisy crowd of demons and fairies. 
There seemed to be millions of them, all clattering and pointing at him. They hobbled and hopped over the ground, jumped into the air, sprang from housetop to housetop, made sudden appearances from holes in the ground, and vanished through solid walls. The palace was a vast building of white marble that seemed as delicate as lacework. It stood in a magnificent square where many beautiful fountains spouted jets of crystal water. King Ashvadai came forth on the balcony, and at his appearance all the demons and fairies became silent and went down on their knees. "'What will ye with me?' he cried in a voice of thunder, and the rabbi approached and bowed before his majesty. "'A mortal, a Jew, has fallen into my hands,' he said, "'and thy subjects crave for his blood. He is a perjurer, they say. Gracious majesty, I would petition for a trial.' "'What manner of mortal is he?' asked Ashmedai. Bar Shalmon stepped forward. "'Jump up here so I may see thee,' commanded the king. "'Jump, jump!' cried the crowd. "'I cannot,' said Bar Shalmon, as he looked up at the balcony thirty feet above the ground. "'Try,' said the rabbi. Bar Shalmon did try, and found the moment he lifted his feet from the ground that he was standing on the balcony. "'Neatly done,' said the king. "'I see thou art quick at learning.' So my teachers always said, replied Bar Shalmon. A proper answer, said the king. Thou art then a scholar. In my own land, returned Bar Shalmon, men said I was great among the learned. So, said the king, and canst thou impart the wisdom of man of the human world to others? I can, said Bar Shalmon. We shall see, said the king. I have a son with a desire for such knowledge. If thou canst make him acquainted with thy store of learning, thy life shall be spared. The petition for a trial is granted. The king waved his scepter, and two slaves seized Bar Shalmon by the arms. He felt himself lifted from the balcony and carried swiftly through the air. Across the vast square, the slaves flew with him, and when over the largest of the fountains, they loosened their hold. Bar Shalmon thought he would fall into the fountain, but to his amazement, he found himself standing on the roof of a building. By his side was the rabbi. "'Where are we?' asked Bar Shalmon. "'I feel bewildered.' "'We are at the court of justice, one hundred miles from the palace,' replied the rabbi. A door appeared before them. They stepped through and found themselves in a beautiful hall. Three judges in red robes and purple wigs were seated on a platform, and an immense crowd filled the galleries in the same queer way as in the synagogue. Bar Shalmon was placed on a small platform in front of the judges. A tiny sprite, only about six inches high, stood on another small platform at his right hand and commenced to read from a scroll that seemed to have no ending. He read the whole account of Bar Shalmon's life. Not one little event was missing. The charge against Bar Shalmon the mortal, the sprite concluded, is that he has violated the solemn oath sworn at his father's deathbed. Then the rabbi pleaded for him and declared that the oath was not binding because Bar Shalmon's father had not informed him of his treasures abroad and could not therefore have been in his right senses. Further, he added, Bar Shalmon was a scholar and the king desired him to teach his wisdom to the crown prince. The chief justice rose to pronounce sentence. Bar Shalmon, he said. Rightly thou shouldest die for thy broken oath. It is a grievous sin, but there is the doubt that thy father may not have been in his right mind. Therefore thy life shall be spared. Bar Shalmon expressed his thanks. When may I return to my home? he asked. Never, replied the chief justice. Bar Shalmon left the court feeling very downhearted. He was safe now, the demons dare not molest him, but he longed to return to his home. How am I to get back to the palace? he asked the rabbi. Perhaps after I have imparted my learning to the crown prince, the king will allow me to return to my native land. That I cannot say. Come, fly with me, said the rabbi. Fly? Yes, see thou hast wings. Bar Shalmon noticed that he was now wearing a garment just like all the demons. When he spread his arms, he found he could fly, and he sailed swiftly through the air to the palace. With these wings, he thought, he would be able to fly home. Think not that, said the rabbi, who seemed to be able to read his thoughts, for thy wings are useless beyond this land. Bar Shalmon found that it would be best for him to carry out his instructions for the present, and he set himself diligently to teach the crown prince. 
The prince was an apt pupil, and the two became great friends. King Ashmedai was delighted and made Bar Shalmon one of his favorites. One day the king said to him, I am about to leave the city for a while to undertake a campaign against a rebellious tribe of demons thousands of miles away. I must take the crown prince with me. I leave thee in charge of the palace. The king gave him a huge bunch of keys. These, he said, will admit into all but one of the thousand rooms in the palace. For that one there is no key, and thou must not enter it. Beware. For several days, Bar Shalmon amused himself by examining the hundreds of rooms in the vast palace until one day he came to the door for which he had no key. He forgot the king's warning and his promise to obey. Open this door for me, he said to his attendants, but they replied that they could not. You must, he said angrily, burst it open. We do not know how to burst open a door, they said. We are not mortal. If we were permitted to enter the room, we should just walk through the walls. Bar Shalmon could not do this, so he put his shoulder to the door, and it yielded quite easily. A strange sight met his gaze. A beautiful woman, the most beautiful he had ever seen, was seated on a throne of gold surrounded by fairy attendants who vanished the moment he entered. Who art thou? asked Bar Shalmon in great astonishment. The daughter of the king, replied the princess, and thy future wife. Indeed, how know you that? he asked. Thou hast broken thy promise to my father the king not to enter this room, she replied. Therefore, thou must die, unless... Tell me quickly, interrupted Bar Shalmon, turning pale, how my life can be saved. Thou must ask my father for my hand, replied the princess. Only by becoming my husband canst thou be saved. But I have a wife and child in my native land, said Bar Shalmon, sorely troubled. Thou hast now forfeited thy hopes of return, said the princess slowly. Once more hast thou broken a promise. It seems to come easy to thee now. Bar Shalmon had no wish to die, and he waited in fear and trembling for the king's return. Immediately he heard of King Ashmedai's approach, he hastened to meet him and flung himself on the ground at his majesty's feet. O king, he cried, I have seen thy daughter, the princess, and I desire to make her my wife. I cannot refuse, returned the king. Such is our law, that he who first sees the princess must become her husband or die. But have a care, Bar Shalmon, thou must swear to love and be faithful ever. I swear, said Bar Shalmon. The wedding took place with much ceremony. The princess was attended by a thousand fairy bridesmaids, and the whole city was brilliantly decorated and illuminated until Bar Shalmon was almost blinded by the dazzling spectacle. The rabbi performed the marriage ceremony, and Bar Shalmon had to swear an oath by word of mouth and in writing that he loved the princess and would never desert her. He was given a beautiful palace full of jewels as a dowry, and the wedding festivities lasted six months. All the fairies and demons invited them in turn. They had to attend banquets and parties and dances in grottos and caves and in the depths of the fairy fountains in the square. Never before in Ergetz had there been such elaborate rejoicings. 3. Some years rolled by, and still Bar Shalmon thought of his native land. One day the princess found him weeping quietly. Why art thou sad, husband mine? she asked. Dost thou no longer love me, and am I not beautiful now? No, it is not that, he said, but for a long time he refused to say more. At last he confessed that he had an intense longing to see his home again. But thou art bound to me by an oath, said the princess. I know, replied Bar Shalmon, and I shall not break it. Permit me to visit my home for a brief while, and I will return and prove myself more devoted to thee than ever. On these conditions, the princess agreed that he should take leave for a whole year. A big black demon flew swiftly with him to his native city. No sooner had Bar Shalmon placed his feet on the ground than he determined not to return to the land of Ergetz. Tell thy royal mistress, he said to the demon, that I shall never return to her. He tore his clothes to make himself look poor, but his wife was overjoyed to see him. She had mourned him as dead. He did not tell of his adventures, but merely said he had been shipwrecked and had worked his way back as a poor sailor. 
He was delighted to be among human beings again, to hear his own language, and to see solid buildings that did not appear and disappear just when they pleased. And as the days passed, he began to think his adventures in fairyland were but a dream. Meanwhile, the princess waited patiently until the year was ended. Then she sent the big black demon to bring Bar Shalmon back. Bar Shalmon met the messenger one night while walking alone in his garden. I have come to take thee back, said the demon. Bar Shalmon was startled. He had forgotten that the year was up. He felt that he was lost, but as the demon did not seize him by force, he saw that there was a possibility of escape. Return and tell thy mistress I refuse, he said. I will take thee by force, said the demon. Thou canst not, Bar Shalman said, for I am the son-in-law of the king. The demon was helpless and returned to Ergetz alone. King Ashmedai was very angry, but the princess counseled patience. I will devise means to bring my husband back, she said. I will send other messengers. Thus it was that Bar Shalman found a troop of beautiful fairies in the garden the next evening. They tried their utmost to induce him to return with them, but he would not listen. Every day different messengers came, big ugly demons who threatened, pretty fairies who tried to coax him, and troublesome sprites and goblins who only annoyed him. Bar Shalman could not move without encountering messengers from the princess in all manner of queer places. Nobody else could see them, and often he was heard talking to invisible people. His friends began to regard him as strange in his behavior. King Ashmedai grew angrier every day, and he threatened to go for Bar Shalmon himself. Nay, I will go, said the princess. It will be impossible for my husband to resist me. She selected a large number of attendants, and the swift flight of the princess and her retinue through the air caused a violent storm to rage over the lands they crossed. Like a thick black cloud, they swooped down on the land where Bar Shalmon dwelt, and their weird cries seemed like the wild shrieking of a mighty hurricane. Down they swept in a tremendous storm such as the city had never known. Then, as quickly as it came, the storm ceased, and the people who had fled into their houses ventured forth again. The little son of Bar Shalmon went out into the garden, but quickly rushed back into the house. Father, come forth and see, he cried. The garden is full of strange creatures brought by the storm. All manner of creeping, crawling things have invaded the garden. Lizards, toads, and myriads of insects. The trees, the shrubs, the paths are covered, and some shine in the twilight like tiny lanterns. Bar Shalmon went out into the garden, but he did not see toads and lizards. What he beheld was a vast array of demons and goblins and sprites, and in a rose bush, the princess, his wife, shining like a star, surrounded by her attendant fairies. She stretched forth her arms to him. Husband mine, she pleaded, I have come to implore thee to return to the land of Ergetz with me. Sadly have I missed thee. Long have I waited for thy coming, and difficult has it been to appease my father's anger. Come, husband mine, return with me. A great welcome awaits thee. I will not return, said Bar Shalmon. Kill him, kill him, shrieked the demons, and they surrounded him, gesticulating fiercely. Nay, harm him not, commanded the princess. Think well, Bar Shalmon, ere you answer again. The sun has set, and night is upon us. Think well until sunrise. Come to me, return, and all shall be well. Refuse, and thou shalt be dealt with as thou hast merited. Think well before the sunrise. And what will happen at sunrise if I refuse? asked Bar Shalmon. Thou shalt see, returned the princess. Bethink thee well, and remember, I await thee here until the sunrise. I have answered, I defy thee, said Bar Shalmon, and he went indoors. Night passed with strange mournful music in the garden, and the sun rose in its glory and spread its golden beams over the city. And with the coming of the light, more strange sounds woke the people of the city. A wondrous sight met their gaze in the marketplace. 
It was filled with hundreds upon hundreds of the queerest creatures they had ever seen. Goblins and brownies, demons and fairies. Dainty little elves ran about the square to the delight of the children, and quaint sprites clambered up the lamp posts and squatted on the gables of the council house. On the steps of that building was a glittering array of fairies and attendant genii, and in their midst stood the princess, a dazzling vision, radiant as the dawn. The mayor of the city knew not what to do. He put on his chain of office and made a long speech of welcome to the princess. Thank you for your cordial welcome, said the princess in reply. And you, the mayor, and ye, the good people of this city of mortals, hearken unto me. I am the princess of the fairy land of Ergetz, where my father, Ashmedai, rules as king. There is one among ye who is my husband. Who is he? the crowd asked in astonishment. Bar Shalmon is his name, replied the princess, and to him am I bound by vows that may not be broken. Tis false, cried Bar Shalmon from the crowd. Tis true. Behold our son, answered the princess, and there stepped forward a dainty elfin boy whose face was the image of Bar Shalmon. I ask of you mortals of the city, the princess continued, but one thing justice that same justice which we in the land of ergetz did give unto bar shalmon when after breaking his oath unto his father he set sail for a foreign land and was delivered into our hands we spared his life we granted his petition for a new trial i but ask that ye should grant me the same petition hear me in your court of justice "'Thy request is but reasonable, princess,' said the mayor. "'It shall not be said that strangers here are refused justice. "'Bar Shalmon, follow me.' He led the way into the chamber of justice, and the magistrates of the city heard all that the princess and her witnesses, among whom was the rabbi, and also all that Bar Shalmon had to say. "'Tis plain,' said the mayor, delivering judgment, that her royal highness, the princess of the fairyland of Ergetz, has spoken that which is true. But Bar Shalmon has in this city wife and child to whom he is bound by ties that may not be broken. Bar Shalmon must divorce the princess and return unto her the dowry received by him on their marriage. If such be your law, I am content, said the princess. What sayest thou, Bar Shalmon? asked the mayor. Oh, I'm content, he answered gruffly. I agree to anything that will rid me of the demon princess. The princess flushed crimson with shame and rage at these cruel words. These words I have not deserved, she exclaimed proudly. I have loved thee and have been faithful unto thee, Bar Shalmon. I accept the decree of your laws and shall return to the land of Ergetz a widow. I ask not for your pity, I ask but for that which is my right, one last kiss. Very well, said Bar Shalmon, still more gruffly, anything to have done with thee. The princess stepped proudly forward to him and kissed him on the lips. Bar Shalmon turned deadly pale and would have fallen had not his friends caught him. Take thy punishment for all thy sins, cried the princess haughtily, for thy broken vows and thy false promises, thy perjury to thy God, to thy father, to my father, and to me. As she spoke, Bar Shalmon fell dead at her feet. At a sign from the princess, her retinue of fairies and demons flew out of the building and up into the air with their royal mistress in their midst and vanished. End of chapter three, recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. Chapter four of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. 
Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa Chapter 4 The Higgledy Piggledy Palace Sarah, the wife of the patriarch Abraham, and the great mother of the Jewish people, was the most beautiful woman who ever lived. Everybody who saw her marveled at the dazzling radiance of her countenance. They stood spellbound before the glorious light that shone in her eyes and the wondrous clearness of her complexion. This greatly troubled Abraham when he fled from Canaan to Egypt. It was disconcerting to have crowds of travelers gazing at his wife as if she were something more than human. Besides, he feared that the Egyptians would see Sarah for the king's harem. So after much meditation, he concealed his wife in a big box. When he arrived at the Egyptian frontier, the customs officials asked him what it contained. Bali, he replied. You say that because the duty on Bali is the lowest, they said. The box must surely be packed with wheat. I will pay the duty on wheat, said Abraham, who was most anxious they should not open the box. The officials were surprised, for as a rule, people endeavor to avoid paying the duties. If you are so ready to pay the higher tax, they said, the box must contain something of greater value. Perhaps it contains spices. Abraham intimated his readiness to pay the duty on the spices. Oh, oh, laughed the officers. Here is a strange person ready to pay heavy dues. He must be anxious to conceal something, gold perchance. I will pay the duty on gold, said Abraham quietly. The officers were now completely bewildered. Our highest duty, said their chief, is on precious stones, and since you decline to open the box, we must demand a tax on the costliest gems. I will pay it, said Abraham simply. The officers could not understand this at all, and after consulting among themselves, they decided that the box must be opened. It may contain something highly dangerous, they argued. Abraham protested, but he was arrested by the guards and the box forced open. When Sarah was revealed, the officials stepped back in amazement and admiration. Indeed, a rare jewel, said the chief. It was immediately decided to send Sarah to the king. When Pharaoh beheld her, he was enraptured. She was simply dressed in the garments of the peasant woman, with no adornments and no jewels, and yet the king thought he had never seen a woman so entrancingly beautiful. When he saw Abraham, however, his brow clouded. Who is this man? he demanded of Sarah. Fearing that he might be imprisoned or even put to death if she acknowledged him as her husband, Sarah replied that he was her brother. Pharaoh felt relieved. He smiled on Abraham and greeted him pleasantly. Thy sister is exceedingly fair to gaze upon, he said, and comely of form. She has bewitched me by her matchless charm. She shall become the favorite of my harem. I shall recompense thee well for thy loss of her. Thou shalt be loaded with gifts. Abraham was too wise to betray the anger that surged in his heart. Courage, my beloved, he whispered to Sarah. The good God will not forsake us. He made pretense of agreeing to Pharaoh's suggestion, and the chief steward of the king gave him an abundant store of gold and silver and jewels, also sheep and oxen and camels. Abraham was conducted to a beautiful palace where many slaves attended him and bowed before him, for one on whom the monarch had showered favors was a great man in the land of Pharaoh. Left alone, Abraham began to pray most devoutly. Meanwhile, Sarah was led into a gorgeous apartment where the queen's own attendants were ordered to array her in the richest of the royal garments. Then she was brought before Pharaoh who dismissed all the attendants. I desire to be alone with thee, said the king to Sarah. I have much to say to thee, and I long to feast my eyes on these features of beauty rare. But Sarah shrank from him. To her he appeared ugly and loathsome. His smile was a vicious leer, and his voice sounded like a harsh croak. Fear not, he said, trying to speak tenderly and kindly. I will do thee no harm. Nay, I will load thee with honors. I will grant any request that thou makest. Then let me go hence, said Sarah quickly. I desire not but that thou shouldst permit me to depart with my brother. Thou jestest, said Pharaoh. That cannot be. I will make thee queen, he cried passionately, and he made a move toward her. Stop, cried Sarah. If thou approachest one step nearer. Pharaoh interrupted with a laugh. 
to threaten a king was so funny that he could not refrain from a hoarse cackle. But Sarah had become suddenly silent. She was looking not at him, but behind him. Pharaoh turned, but observed nothing. He could not see what Sarah saw. A figure, a spirit, clutching a big stick. Come, said the king, be not foolish. I cannot be angry with a creature so fair as thou art. But it is not meet, nay, it is not wise, to utter threats to one who wears a crown. Sarah made no reply. She was no longer afraid. She knew that her prayers and those of Abraham had been answered, and that no harm would befall her. Pharaoh mistook her silence and advanced toward her. As he did so, however, he felt a tremendous blow on the head. He was stunned for a moment. On recovering himself, he looked all round the room, but could not see anything. Sarah continued to stand motionless. Strange, muttered Pharaoh. I, I, I thought someone had entered the room. Again he moved toward Sarah, and once more he received a staggering blow, this time on the shoulder. It was only by a great effort of will that he did not cry out in pain. He concluded he must have been seized by some sudden illness, but after a moment he felt better and bravely tried to smile at Sarah. I just thought of something most important, said he, attempting to offer some explanation for nearly toppling over in an undignified manner. He stood nearer to Sarah and began to raise his hand to touch her. If thou layest but a finger on me, it will be at thy peril, exclaimed Sarah, her eyes flashing angrily. Shah, he cried, losing patience, and he raised his hand. This time the cudgel of the spirit, invisible to Pharaoh, did not strike him. It came down gently and rested lightly on the king's outstretched arm, and Pharaoh could not move it. He grew pale and trembled. Are thou a witch? he gasped at last. Sarah was so angry when she heard this insult that he flashed a signal with her eyes to the spirit, and the latter plied his cudgel lustily about the king's head and shoulders, making the monarch break out in most unkindly howls of pain thy pardon thy pardon i crave he managed to scream i mean not what i said i am ill very ill my body aches my arm is paralyzed the cudgeling ceased and pharaoh was able to move his arm he writhed in agony for he was bruised all over he rushed hastily away saying he would return on the morrow sarah found herself locked in but she was not again disturbed pharaoh however had further adventures the spirit was in merry mood and had a night's entertainment at the king's expense. No sooner did the king lie down upon his bed than the spirit tilted it and sent him sprawling on the floor. Whenever Pharaoh tried to lie down, the same thing happened. He went from one room to another, but all efforts at rest were unavailing. Every bed rejected him, and every chair and couch did the same, although when he commanded others to lie down, they did so quite comfortably. He tried lying down with one of his attendants, but while the latter was able to remain undisturbed, Pharaoh found himself bodily lifted, stood upon his head, spun around, and then rolled over on the ground. His physicians could provide no remedy. His magicians, hastily summoned from their own slumbers, could afford no explanation, and Pharaoh spent a terrible night wandering from room to room and up and down the corridors, where the corners seemed to go out of their way to bump against him, and the stairs seemed to go down when he wanted to walk up, and vice versa. Such a higgledy-piggledy -de palace was never seen. Worse still, with the first streak of dawn, he noticed that he was smitten with leprosy. Hastily he sent for Abraham and said, Who and what thou art I know not. Thou and thy sister have brought a plague upon me. I desire to make her my queen, but now I say to you, Rid me of this leprosy and get thee hence with thy sister. I will bestow riches on ye, but get ye gone, and speedily. With the magic jewel which he wore on his breast, Abraham restored Pharaoh to health, and then departed with Sarah. These final words he said to Pharaoh, Sarah is not my sister, but my wife. I give thee this warning. Should thy descendants at any time seek to persecute our descendants, then will our God, he, the one God of the universe, surely punish the king with plague again. And many years afterward, as you read in the Bible, the prediction came true. End of chapter 4 Recording by Farno Jahangiri
Chapter 5 of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Brown, St. Paul, Minnesota. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa. The Red Slipper. Rosy Red was a sweet little girl with beautiful blue eyes, soft pink cheeks, and glorious ruddy gold hair of the tinge that artists love to paint. Her mother died the day she was born, but her grandmother looked after her with such tender care that Rosy Red regarded her as her mother. She was very happy, was Rosy Red. All day long she sang as she tripped gaily about the house or the woods that surrounded it, and so melodious was her voice that the birds gathered on the trees to listen to her and to encourage her to continue by daintily chirruping whenever she ceased. Merrily Rosy Red performed all the little duties her grandmother called upon her to do, and on festivals she was allowed to wear a delightful pair of red leather slippers, her father's gift to her on her first birthday. Now, although neither she nor her father knew it, they were magic slippers, which grew larger as her feet grew. Rosy Red was an only child, and so did not know that slippers usually don't grow. Her grandmother knew the secret of the slippers, but she did not tell, and her father had become too moody and too deeply absorbed in his own thoughts and affairs to notice anything. One day, Rosie Red remembered it only too sadly. She returned from the woods to find her grandmother gone and three strange women in the house. She stopped suddenly in the midst of her singing, and her cheeks turned pale, for she did not like the appearance of the strangers. "'Who are you?' she asked. "'I am your new mother,' answered the oldest of the three. "'And these are my daughters, your two new sisters.' Rosy Red trembled with fear. They were all three so ugly, and she began to cry. Her new sisters scolded her for that, and would have beaten her had not her father appeared. He spoke kindly, telling her that he had married again, because he was lonely, and that her stepmother and stepsisters would be good to her but Rosy Red knew different. She hastened away to her own little room and hid her slippers, of which she was very proud. "'They have turned my dear granny out of doors. They will take from me my beautiful slippers,' she sobbed. After that, Rosy Red sang no more. She became a somber girl and a drudge. The birds could not understand. They followed her through the woods, but she was silent, as if she had been stricken dumb and her eyes always seemed eager to be shedding tears. Also, she was too busy to notice her feathered friends. She had to collect firewood for the home, to draw water from the well, and to struggle along with the heavy bucket whose weight made her arms and her back ache with pain. Sometimes, too, her white arms were scarred with bruises, for her cruel and selfish stepsisters did not hesitate to beat her. Often they went out to parties or to dances, and on these occasions she had to act as their maid and help them to dress. Rosy Red did not mind. She was only happy when they were out of the house. Then only did she sing softly to herself, and the birds came to listen. And thus many unhappy years passed away. Once, when her father was away from home, her stepsisters went off to a wedding dance. They told her not to forget to draw water from the well, and warned her that if she forgot as she did the last time, they would beat her without mercy when they returned. So Rosy Red, tired though she was, went out into the darkness to draw water. She lowered the bucket, but the cord broke, and the pail fell to the bottom of the well. She ran back home for a long stick with a hook on the end of it to recover the bucket, and as she put it into the water, she sang, Swing and sweep till all does cling and to the surface safely bring. Now it so happened that a sleeping gin dwelt at the bottom of the well. He could only be awakened by a spell, and although Rosy Red did not know it, the words she uttered, which she had once heard her granny use, were the spell. The gin awoke, and he was so delighted with the sweet voice that he promptly decided to help the girl, whom he saw peering down into the water. He fastened the bucket to the stick, and taking some jewels of a treasure of which he was the guardian, he put them inside. "'Oh, how beautiful!' cried Rosy Red when she saw the glittering gems. 
they are ever so much nicer than those my sisters put on to go to the ball then she sat thinking for a while and a bright idea came into her head i will give these jewels to my sisters she said perhaps they will be kinder to me she waited impatiently until the sisters returned from the dance and immediately told them for a moment they were too dazed to speak when they saw the sparkling precious stones then they looked meaningly at one another and asked how she came by them rosie told them the words she had sung ah we thought so said the sisters to her horror the jewels are ours we hid them in the well for safety you have stolen them in vain rosie red protested her sisters would not listen they beat her severely and told her to hurry off to bed and then snatching the bucket they hurried off to the well they lowered the bucket and sang the words that rosie red had sung at least they thought they sang but their voices were harsh the sleeping gin awoke again but he did not like the croaking sound the sisters made aha he laughed i will teach you to disturb my sleep with hideous noises and shall punish such pranks played upon me here are some more croakers then filled the bucket with slimy toads and frogs the sisters were so enraged they came back home and dragged poor rosy red from her bed you cat you thief screamed one you cheat exclaimed the other off you go not another day can you remain in this house rosy red was too much taken by surprise to say anything it was an outrage to turn her out of her father's house while he was away on a journey but the thought came to her that she could hardly be less happy living alone in the woods she had only time to snatch her pretty red slippers and as soon as she was out of sight of the house she put them on it made her feel less miserable the sun was now rising and when its rays shone on her she began to sing with her old friends the birds twittering all about her she felt quite happy on and on she walked much farther into the woods than ever before when she grew tired there was always a pleasant shady nook where she could rest when she became hungry there were fruit trees in abundance and when she was thirsty she always came to a spring of clear fresh water the magic slippers guided her all day long she wandered and when toward evening she noticed her slippers were muddy she took them off to clean and then darkness fell it began to rain and she grew frightened she crouched under a tree until she noticed a light some short distance away she got up and walked toward it when quite close she saw that the light came from a cave dwelling an old woman came out to meet her it was her grandmother but so many years had passed that rosy red did not recognize her granny however at once knew her come in my child and take shelter from the rain she said kindly and rosy red was only too glad to accept the invitation the inside of the cave was quite cozy and rosy red who was almost completely exhausted quickly fell fast asleep she awoke with a start my pretty red slippers she cried where are they she put her hand in the pocket of her tattered dress but could only find one i must have lost the other she sobbed i must go out and look for it no no said granny you cannot do that a storm is raging rosy red peered out through the door of the cave and drew back in fear as she saw the lightning flash and heard the thunder rolling she sobbed herself to sleep again and this time was awakened by voices she feared it might be her sisters who had discovered her hiding place and had come to drag her forcibly back home again she crept into a corner of the cave and listened intently a man was speaking know you to whom this red slipper belongs he was asking i found it in the woods rosy red was on the point of rushing out to regain her lost slipper when her granny's voice very loud on purpose that she might hear restrained her no no i know not she repeated again and again and at length the man departed granny came back into the cave and said i am sorry rosy red but for aught i know he might be a messenger from your cruel sisters and of course i cannot like anyone take you back to them next day the man called again this time with several attendants again rosy red concealed herself i am a chieftain's son and wealthy said the man i must find the wearer of this shoe only a graceful and beautiful girl can wear such a dainty slipper 
Rosie Red did not know whether to be more frightened or pleased when her granny told her the man was very handsome and of noble bearing. Day after day he came, each time with more retainers, and finally he arrived mounted on a richly capacioned camel with a hundred and one followers, all mounted as he was. The girl I seek is here, he said. Deny it no longer. My servants have scoured the woods and the whole neighborhood. One is prepared to swear he heard a young girl singing yesterday. Rosie Red saw that concealment was no longer possible. She liked the man's voice, and she stepped out bravely, wearing her one slipper. The stranger, bowing low before her, held out the other, and Rosie Red took it and put it on. It fitted perfectly. "'Many girls have tried to put on that shoe,' said the young man, "'but all have failed. And I have sworn to make the wearer my bride. I am a chieftain's son, and thou shalt be a princess.' So Rosy Red left the cave with her granny, and mounting a camel was led through the woods to her new home, where she knew naught but happiness, and the days of her sufferings were quite forgotten, and always she wore her magic red slippers. End of The Red Slipper Chapter 6 of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Wanda. Chapter 6 The Star Child. When Abraham was born, his father, Terah, who was one of the chief officers of King Nimrod, gave a banquet to a large number of his friends. He entertained them most sumptuously, and the merriest of the guests was the chief of the king's magicians. He was an old man, exceedingly fond of wine, and he drank deeply. The feast lasted throughout the night, and the gray dawn of early morning appeared in the sky, before Terra's friends thought of rising from the table. Suddenly the old magician jumped to his feet. See! he cried excitedly, pointing through the open door to the sky. See yon bright star in the east! It flashes across the heavens! The others looked, but said they could see nothing. Fools! shouted the old man. Ye may not see, but I do. I, the wisest of the king's magicians and astrologers, tell you it is an omen. See how the brilliant star darts across the sky! It has swallowed a smaller star, and another, even a third, yet a fourth. It is an omen, I say, a portent that bodes ill. And moreover, he added, growing still more excited, it is an omen connected with the birth of the little son of Terra. Nonsense, cried Terra. Talk not to me of nonsense said the magician sternly. I must hasten to inform the king. Hurriedly he left the house of Terra, followed by the other magicians, some of whom now said they also had seen a star swallow four others. They did not think it wise to contradict their chief, although he had drunk a great deal of wine and could not walk steadily. King Nimrod was awakened from his sleep, and his magicians appeared before him. "'O oh, king, live forever!' said the chief, by way of a salute. "'Grave indeed is the news that has led us to disturb thee in thy slumbers. This night a son has been born unto thy officer, Terra, and with the coming of the dawn a warning has appeared to us in the skies.' I, the chief of thy magicians, did observe a brilliant star rise in the east, and dart across the heavens, and swallow four smaller stars. We observed it too, said the other magicians. And what means this? inquired the king. It means, said the chief magician mysteriously, that this star-child will destroy other children, that his descendants will conquer thine. Take warning, 
purchase this child from thy officer terra and slay it so that it may not grow up a danger to thee thy advice pleases me said the cruel king in vain terra protested king nimrod would not disregard the warning of his magicians but he consented to give terra three days in which to deliver up the child sad at heart terra returned home and on the second day told his wife the terrible news we must not allow our little son abraham to be slain she said if he is to become great he must live i have a plan king nimrod will not be satisfied unless a child is slain therefore take thou the child of a slave to him and tell him it is abraham he will not know the difference and so that the trick shall not be discovered take our child away and hide it for a time terah thought this an excellent idea and he carried it out the sick child of a slave which was born only a few hours before abraham was taken to king nimrod who killed it with his own hands and terah's little boy was secretly carried by his nurse to a cave in a forest there abraham was carefully nurtured and brought up from time to time abraham was visited by his father and mother and not until he was ten years old did they think it safe to bring him from the cave in the forest to their home even then they deemed it best to be careful their elder son haran was a maker of idols and abraham became his helper without haran being told it was his brother abraham the star child was a strange little boy he did not believe in the idols i worship the sun by day and the moon and the stars by night he said to haran there are times when you cannot see the sun by day nor the moon and stars by night said haran but you can always have your idol with you this troubled little abraham for a while but one day he came running to his brother and said i have made a discovery i shall no longer worship the sun nor the moon nor the stars there must be some mighty power behind them that orders them to shine the sun by day and the moon and stars by night that great power shall be my god abraham asked all sorts of queer questions of his father who made the sun and the moon and the stars he asked i know not replied terra i have asked all your idols your gods and they answer not said abraham they cannot speak said terra then why do you pray to them and worship them persisted the boy terra did not answer abraham asked his mother but she could only tell him that the gods who created everything were with them in the house but haran made those silly things of wood and clay said abraham and at last they refused to answer his awkward questions mostly he stood at the door of the house gazing at the sky as if trying to read the secrets behind the sun and stars thou shouldst have been placed with an astrologer said haram to him one day thou art a child of the stars terror heard this and was angry with haran for he feared that the secret of the child's birth might be betrayed i know not why my father keeps thee here said haran afterward to abraham thou art becoming lazy i have worked enough this day and i will go out to the woods to watch the hunting stay thou here perchance a purchaser may come be heedful and obtain good payments for the idols not long after haran left an old man entered the shop and said he wished to buy an idol i dropped my idol on the ground yesterday and it broke he said i must have a stronger one certainly thou must have a god so strong that naught can break it 
answered Abraham, tell me, how old art thou? Full sixty years, boy, replied the man. And yet thou hast not reached years of wisdom, said Abraham. See how easy it is to break thy gods. And he took a stick and smashed one of the idols with a single blow. The old man fled from the shop, horrified. Next, a woman entered. I am too poor to have an idol of my own, she said. Therefore I have brought a little food as an offering to one of the many gods here. Offer it to any idol that pleases thee, said Abraham with a laugh. The woman placed it before the smallest idol. This idol is small and surly, said the boy. It does not accept thy offering. And he raised his stick and smashed it. Try a bigger idol with thy offering, he said. And the woman did so. Thou also hast no manners, said Abraham, addressing the god. Eat, or I shall smash thee to pieces. The idol, of course, did not eat, and so Abraham broke it, and the woman rushed out into the street in great alarm. Abraham tried all the idols in turn with the food, and as each was unable to eat, he broke them all, except the largest. Before this idol, which was as tall as a man, he paused, then, laughing loudly, he placed the stick, which he had used, in the idol's hand. By this time a crowd, attracted by the cries of the old man and the woman, had gathered at the door. "'What hast thou done?' they demanded angrily. "'I? Nothing,' answered Abraham. "'See, the largest idol holds in its hand a big stick. It seems to me that he has been angry.' and has killed all the others. Ask him why he did this. The people stood bewildered, until Terah and Haran returned. What is the meaning of this? they asked, pointing to the broken idols. Oh, such fun, replied Abraham. There has been a fight here. A woman brought a food offering to the gods, and they quarreled because they all wanted it. So the big fellow here got angry, and taking up the stick, which you see, he still holds. He beat the others and smashed them to bits. Absurd, cried Haran. The idols cannot do these things. Ask the big fellow to strike me if I have told lies, returned Abraham. Seize your nonsense, commanded his father. What funny gods you are said Abraham musingly, standing before the big idol. Do you think he will hit me if I smack his face? Before anybody could stop him, he smacked the idol's face, and then knocked off its head with the stick. Some of the people ran off to the palace, and soon came an order from King Nimrod that the idol-breaker should be brought before him. Abraham, Haran, and Terah were seized by the guards and marched off to the palace. "'Which of you broke the idols?' asked the king angrily. "'I did, because they were rude and would not accept the offering,' said Abraham. "'How can they be gods if they have no sense?' "'Not altogether a foolish remark,' said Nimrod, smiling. If idols please thee not, then worship fire which has the power to consume. Fire itself can be quenched by water, replied Abraham. Then worship water, returned Nimrod. But water is absorbed by the clouds, said the boy. And clouds are blown by the wind, said Nimrod. Man can withstand the force of wind, said Abraham. So he will talk all day long, this child of the stars, exclaimed Haran. Child of the stars, said the chief magician. Now I understand, O oh, king, 
this must be no other than the child of terra against whom at his birth we warned your majesty the message of the stars has come true he has dared to destroy our gods soon he will destroy us is this in truth the child of the stars asked nimrod of terra but the latter did not answer it is in truth your majesty said haran i have long suspected it then why didst thou not inform me exclaimed the king in a rage i will test this star child with the power of my god fire and thou haran for thy neglect must also suffer guards let them be bound and cast into the furnace to which i pray daily terra thou art their father i can forgive thee thou wilt suffer sufficiently in losing both thy sons to my god the fire was made so hot that the men who endeavored to cast abraham and haran into the flames were caught and burned to death twelve men in all perished before terah's sons were thrown into the furnace haran was burnt to ashes at once but to the surprise of the vast crowd that stood at a safe distance abraham walked unharmed in the flames the fetters which bound him having been consumed when king nimrod saw this he trembled come forth boy he cried to abraham and i will pardon thee bid your men take me out he answered all who approached the terrific fire however were burned to death and at last when nimrod said he would bow down before abraham's god the boy came forth unharmed all the people bowed down before the boy who told them to rise saying worship not me but the true god who dwells in heaven beyond the sun and the stars and whose glory is everywhere king nimrod loaded the boy with presents and bade him return home in peace end of chapter six chapter seven of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by tally haas Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa Chapter 7 Abi Fresha's Feast There was not in the whole city of Baghdad a greedier man than Abi Fresha, and you may be sure he was not popular. It was not that he was rich and refused to give heed to the needs of the poor. He was, in truth, a merchant in moderately affluent circumstances, and he did not withhold charity from the deserving, but he was a man of enormous appetite, and did not scruple to descend to trickery to secure an invitation to a meal. So skillful, indeed, did he become in wielding these favors from his friends and from those to whom he traded, that he devoted the major portion of each day to feeding and left himself little time to attend to his business affairs. Moreover, he grew unpleasantly fat. His face was red and bloated with much wine drinking. He was not a nice person to look upon at all, and those who had aforetime been his friends came to the conclusion that the day had arrived when he should be taught a severe lesson. And so it came to pass that when Abi Fressa was standing in the bazaar at the hour of the midday meal and eagerly scanning the crowd to discover some acquaintance whom he could induce to ask him to dinner, he saw Ben Maslaya, one of the wealthiest and most generous of men in Baghdad. "'Ah, my excellent friend,' Abi cried, warmly greeting ben maslaya tis almost an eternity since my unworthy eyes were cast upon thy pleasant countenance peace be on thee and thine unto the end of days also to thee returned ben maslaya and whence comest thou and whither goest thou o most hospitable friend abi fressa asked these questions hastily his beady eyes searching the other's face hungrily for a sign upon which he could seize to invite himself to a meal it is the hour of the midday meal goest thou perchance to thy pious home thither go i 
said Ben Maslaya. My path lies in the same direction, said Abi Fressa. It will be pleasant to walk together. Come. And he grasped Ben Maslaya by the arm. It is kind of thee, friend Abi Fressa, rejoined the other. But I have built me a new abode on the other side of the city. Abi Fressa's face fell for a moment, but he was clever enough to take advantage of the news. A new dwelling erected by the wealthy Ben Maslaya, he said winningly, must be a building of magnificence worth seeing. Indeed it is, as thou sayest, cried the other enthusiastically, and forthwith he launched into a lavish description of his residence. Abi Fressa grew impatient when Ben Maslaya began to describe each room in detail. His hunger increased when, in glowing words, his friend painted the gorgeous dining room, and his mouth watered at the information that the cellars were stocked with a thousand bottles of wine. "'Blessings on thee and thy wine cellar and thy house,' murmured Abi Fressa, when he could get in a word. "'I have no business of consequence to transact this afternoon. I could not pay thee a better compliment than to spend it examining thy treasures.' "'Of a certainty thou couldst not,' ascended the other, to his great glee. "'Then let us proceed,' said Abi Fressa. So they set out, Ben Maslaya still continuing his glowing accounts of his wonderful house. It must be as spacious as a palace, put in Abi Fressa. Thou speakest truth, agreed Ben Maslaya. I will illustrate to thee the vast expanse of my new residence. He stopped in his walk, measured one hundred paces in the street, and intimated that this represented the width of the central courtyard. Abi Fressa was overwhelmed with surprise but he was growing momentarily hungrier and it was with difficulty he could restrain his impatience yes yes he said i would fain gaze upon the outer doors of thy dwelling such an outer door said ben maslaya hast thou never seen its width and again he began to measure the street to indicate its dimensions and further he added calmly either failing to notice or deliberately overlooking abi fressa's growing distress its shape and designs are and he dragged the other through several streets until he found a door to which he could point as being not altogether unlike his own but i weary thee he said suddenly as if regretful of the time he had wasted nay nay not at all abi Fressa assured him although he was inwardly fuming at the delay thy descriptions delight me immeasurably thou hast not yet unfolded to me the wonders of thy dining room thereupon ben maslaya took up the tail of the dining-room and its furniture, and he dragged his companion half a mile out of their path to show him the furniture emporium where he had purchased the tables and couches. Then he retraced his steps to point out a building from which he had borrowed certain ideas of decoration. Abi Fressa's fat body was unused to such exertion. He perspired freely, his legs tottered beneath him, and his tongue was parched. He was really very uncomfortable and the pangs of hunger from which he suffered were not lessened when ben maslaya stopped outside a restaurant to speak to a friend who was just going in the conversation was prolonged and all the time abi Fressa's nose was tickled by the smell of the cooking he endured agonies especially when the friend invited ben maslaya to dine with him and ben maslaya after a moment's hesitation firmly declined i must apologize to thee for this delay said ben maslaya when at length he left his friend but the matter was urgent i will make up to thee by the magnificence of the feast abi fressa thanked him cordially for his consideration but his pain was intense when ben maslaya insisted on giving him fullest particulars of all the dishes he would enjoy yes yes abi kept saying but ben maslaya stayed his interruptions thy dwelling is far from the centre of the city abi fressa managed to say at last that is a virtue commented ben maslaya and he followed it up with the advice given to him by a renowned physician that a house was healthiest when it stood alone away from the busy haunts of men to all this and more abi fressa was compelled to listen his whole fat body ached with weariness he was tortured by a raging thirst and he fancied he felt himself growing thinner so fearfully hungry was he the sun was sinking when at last they reached the house and abi fressa was afraid for a moment that his host would enlarge upon his architecture to his relief however they entered straightway and ben maslaya said to him thou must be fatigued after thy walk rest awhile abi fressa was truly grateful 
and taking off his shoes, he stretched himself on a comfortable couch. He dozed for a while, but was awakened by the noise of clattering dishes and the smell of savory cooking. He almost forgot his unpleasant afternoon in the prospect of the coming feast. But Ben Maslaya came not. Abi Fressa soon felt angry. He could not restrain himself from banging a big brass gong to summon a servant. But although he banged several times, no servant answered the call. Abi Fressa nearly shed tears in despair. Suddenly, Ben Maslaya appeared before him. I thought I would give thee ample rest, he said suavely. Come, we must perform our ablutions. Abi Fressa would have preferred to have dispensed with this ceremony, but he could not offend his host by declining to conform to the custom of the period. Ben Maslaya led the way to the bath chamber, and there they spent quite an hour. Then, thoroughly refreshed, the host said, Now I will show thee the wonders and beauties of my domain. Abi Fressa was almost stupefied with hunger, but he had to permit himself to be led through each room and to hear again the praises that had already been poured into his ears all afternoon. Only the smell of the cooking fortified his spirit and enabled him to undergo the ordeal. He seemed to wake up from a stupor when his host opened a door and exclaimed, This is the feasting chamber. A scene of splendor burst upon the eyes of Abi Fressa. He rubbed his hands in glee and was ready to forget and forgive the discomforts of the past few hours. The dining room presented a magnificent appearance, with its gorgeous hangings, its many lamps, and its marble floor. But these things Abi Fressa scarcely noticed. His gaze was promptly directed on the table. It was spread with the most sumptuous repast that ever he had seen. There were dishes upon dishes of tasty sweetmeats, huge platters of luscious fruits, many bottles of wine, and covered bowls from which arose the most appetizing aroma. Abi Fressa's mouth began to twitch, and his eyes glowed. He moved forward to a seat. "'Good friend,' said his host, "'let me first introduce you to our notice of my staff of servants.' He clapped his hands, and immediately, in quite startling fashion, a dozen servants stepped from behind the hangings, which had hidden them, and bowed before their master. With a dozen attendants to wait upon him, Abi Fressa saw that he was going to enjoy a meal worthy of the occasion. He looked upon the slaves with satisfaction. "'Note, my worthy Abi Fressa, said Ben Maslai, "'that this is no ordinary retinue of servants. "'Each one comes from a different part of the known world. "'Rosh, the big man there, head of them all, "'is the only native of Baghdad. "'He has an interesting history. "'He has been in my service since his birth. "'His father was likewise in the service of my sainted father "'and his grandfather, but let that suffice. "'I would not imprison thy appetite longer.' Shenny, that is, the second servant, the big black Nubian there, bring thither the first dish. Shenny took up one of the dishes from the table and placed himself by the side of his master. Stands he not well? asked Ben Maslaya in admiring tones. He is a descendant of kings. In ancient days his ancestors sat on a throne and ruled over a huge territory beyond the deserts of Africa. I obtained him during my journeys in that country. And on that occasion, I discovered this beautiful rug in a shop in Cairo. Saying which, Ben Maslaya rose from his seat and fingered lovingly one of the hangings of the room. Abi Fressa did not rise. He was trying to keep his temper. The dish which Shenny held so tantalizingly under his very nose made him mad with hunger and desire. But Ben Maslaya took no heed. He began to delight upon the virtues of another piece of tapestry. This, he said, I bought in the famous bazaar of Damascus. It is hundreds of years old, and in that city, too, I became possessed of my third servant, Shilishi, there, a true born of the Holy Land, and the keeper of my camels. Our meeting was an adventure. Abi Fressa was not listening. This was beyond endurance. He felt that he soon would collapse in a faint on the floor, and still Ben Maslaya droned on. There was a servant from China, and also a cunningly wrought vase from that land, a brown page boy in a red turban from India, from which land his host had also brought the lamp standing in the center of the table, and some of the flowers which adorned the room. You would not guess, he was saying, that many of these blooms are not natural. 
they are artificial but mixed so skilfully with the real that even experts would be deluded by this time abi fressa was beyond the power of speech two or three times he tried to speak but could not he was really too weak never in his life before had he been so hungry so tortured it was some time however before ben maslaya noticed his plight art thou ill he exclaimed that grieves me but fortunately i have in the house an experienced apothecary who can apply leeches and relieve thee of foul blood no no pleaded the unhappy abi fressa finding his tongue at this dismal prospect perchance a glass of rare cordial will revive thee said ben maslaya taking one of the bottles from the table abi fressa managed to gasp the word yes and rush held a goblet into which ben maslaya poured a rich red fluid drink this he said kindly holding the cup to his guest's lip at last thought abi fressa as he opened his mouth the next moment he sprang from his stool with astonishing agility sputtering and cursing the liquid was bitter in the extreme and the taste it left in his mouth most horrid now i know i have been hoodwinked he screamed in rage and he dashed toward the outer door stay stay what ails thee cried ben maslaya stop stop echoed the servants as abi fressa commenced to run the cry was taken up in the street by those who saw a fat man panting along in the darkness pursued by a number of servants stop thief was the cry of one man in his excitement the town guards heard and without any ado they seized abi fressa and hauled him off to jail in vain he begged for mercy and struggled for freedom if thou wilt not behave we shall use force the guards said and they beat him with staves at jail abi fressa was flung into a cell and there on a bed of straw on the ground he spent a horrible sleepless night he ached in every bone in his body he was bruised all over and his hunger was such that he felt he had never eaten in his life his reflections were sad as you may well imagine and they led him to a vow that never again would he seek the hospitality of his friends he realized at last that he had made himself obnoxious and had been cleverly and deservedly well punished yet even his sufferings were not at an end for next morning when he was released and sent for his physician the later prescribed a diet of gruel and barley water for a whole week end of chapter seven recording by tally haas